Hello Leiden. Hello Leiden. Bonjour Leiden. Hello Leiden. Marhaba Leiden. Ciao Leiden. Hi Puday Leiden. Hello Leiden. Welcome to the newest episode of our English speaking weekly show. As you know, our show is about stories, stories of international community living in Leiden. And today in our studio, we have two fantastic guests who are going to share their story with you. So we have Ivan Junic from Hi. Serbia and we have Aurora Sinurazzi. <laughs> Welcome to our studio. Thank you. So, uh, Iva, why don't you very briefly introduce yourself to our audience? Uh, so, I'm a biologist. I came to Leiden uh, about five years ago uh, to do one part of my PhD research, and then I fell in love and I stayed. So now I live in Leiden. Uh, I love this place a lot. It's really my favorite city, and I'm so happy to actually live here. Um, I'm actually a cave biologist, so there is not much opportunity to do research for me in this country. That's why I, there are no caves. There are no caves, there's no limestone, and that's why I travel a lot abroad. And I have to say, this is also the reason why I don't speak Dutch yet, because I, I do spend several months per year uh, to some you know, other places in the world for my research. What about you, Aurora? Uh, I'm Aurora, I'm from yourself. Italy, I come from Rome. I came to the Netherlands uh, seven years ago to do my master internship in uh, Groningen. I'm also a biologist and I did my PhD also in uh, Groningen on virology and vaccinology. So um, so you transformed from biologist to virologist? Yeah, during my master. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I came to Leiden uh, October 2020 to work at uh, Janssen Vaccines. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I'm in the middle of all the corona vaccine uh, making. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna ask lots of questions about that too. <laughs> Definitely. Well, welcome, welcome. Um, you. As you know, we have a tradition in our studio that we usually ask you to bring little personal items that have very strong value for you, and we share it with our audience. I'm bringing you this amazing box beautiful which it has a, is a beetle on it and it is a birthday gift that i got from my polish friend monica uh, who is also an expert living in leiden and she works for jansen actually oh. yeah and uh, this uh, box has been hand painted by her friend who is an artist uh, and what is really cool about it is this beetle has uh, quite a story to tell so i mentioned i'm a biologist and uh, my job is to discover new species mm -hmm. for science, one of the things I'm doing. So this is the beetle that my team and I discovered in Borneo um, a few years ago. And we named this species after Leonardo DiCaprio. Wow. <laughs> yes, who is this oh, not only famous actor, but he's also a very dedicated conservationist. Mm -hmm. And we, in this way, we wanted to honor him for his, you know, environmental uh, efforts. Uh, and what turned out to be amazing is that when he you know, found out about this discovery and when this paper was published, he changed his profile photo on Facebook to the photo of our beetle. That is beautiful. Oh. That was really cool and, you know, the media went wild over it. It was featured in many international media. So for me, this is the best endorsement of my work I could ever wish for. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing <laughs> Leonardo with us. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Aurora? Yes. Uh, this is a, a medal uh, I and other employees from uh, Janssen Vaccines got last month in May. And it's a kind of a yeah, recognition reward of the efforts to make the Corona vaccine come true. And uh, well, it, it has a nice personal value because it's been uh, a lot of months of hard work and it's uh, nice to feel acknowledged besides, you know, uh, just working behind the shadows in a way. Of course, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you <laughs> yeah. from all of us, really. Uh, you all worked really hard to get us to the place where we are now. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for you that. definitely deserved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, you also know that we made short profiles about you, right? Okay. Uh, why don't we check, Eva, yours? Where did okay. you take us? Okay, let's see. <laughs> Hello, Eva. Hi, how are you? you? I'm good, how are you? Come in. What is this place? So this is Natural History Museum Naturalis. Okay. And this is the whole reason why I came to Leiden in the first place. 
Okay. So I came here during my PhD thesis and the part of work I did in Naturalis. Okay. Of course, the building didn't look like this at the time. Okay. Uh, and I was working uh, in the lab, Silvius Laboratory, on some molecular uh, work. Uh, and Naturalis has always been my source of inspiration and natural history museums like this. Okay, so where we are going? Oh, we are going to Life Science, which okay. is actually my favorite place uh, in Naturalis. I really love how the whole place has been designed. Okay. Welcome. Wow. So, Eva, what do you want to show us? Well, I want to show we'll you life you. science. Okay. Uh, that is a place where scientists from Naturalis can present their research to the general public. And I think that is very important because, you know, general public often really doesn't have the opportunity to hear about scientific research from the people who actually did the research. And I think it's also important because it's kind of, you know, bridging the gap between so-called science world and general public world. Here. Oh, great. So we have some fossils. So hopefully now when the world is, you know, back to normal, there will be soon uh, some scientists here presenting their work. Oh, here they do that. Okay. Yes, that's the stage for uh, And there's a lot of like um, birds, animals yes. preserved here. Yes, and there is a place where scientists actually work. So you can also see them, you know, doing their actual job. So where we go from here now? Um, from here, actually, I would like to take you to my home and to show you my home lab because this is a place where I work. Uh, I'm a visiting researcher in Naturalis, but actually I don't work here on a daily basis. I work uh, at home and I want to tell you actually about what I do and to show you my mini Naturalis, so my mini natural history collection, collection that I have at home. Yeah? Okay. Are you up for that? Let's go. Let's go. So welcome to my home. Uh, it's also a place where I work and where, where our lab is. So, Let's go. Please come in. We go here. And welcome to a place where two biologists work. Oh, this is and Pook. This is Pook. She's oh, oh. not mine. I'm just Patsy. Think of Pookie, say hello to the camera. So this is your lab? So this is lab. Uh, me and my husband, we are biologists. And together we run an organization called Taxon Expeditions. So what we do is we... Uh, bring people who are not scientists themselves, but are, you know, members of the general public, to remote places like jungles of Borneo, Panama, to do research with us. And the goal of every expedition that we organize is to discover new species. And where did you meet your husband? Uh, we met here in Leiden, and that's actually... So, I came here to do uh, my PhD thesis, uh, and I met him, and that's why I stay here, actually. And, of course, in the lab where we work, we also, you know, bring, sometimes we have some samples that we collect. These are actually uh, insects I was working on during my PhD uh, research. Mm. And they're cave beetles. Okay. So I'm a cave biologist. And these beetles are very interesting because they are completely blind, they're pigmented, and they live only in caves. You cannot find them anywhere else. So they're so, you know, specialized to live in this extreme environment. Wow. And then we have here some more live animals, apart from poop. <laughs> we have slugs. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Any, are we opening the box? Any speciality about them? So, <laughs> these are slugs that could be maybe a new species. Ah. Uh, but we, we put them here uh, because we want to uh, film the mating. So okay. we want to report the mating behavior. Are it's they just, happy? Well, I think we'll have to actually put them in a, in a bigger box. Yeah, because uh, this is too small. They need, yeah, a bit more So there space. are three of them. There are three of them, yes. Okay. Do you like slugs? No. Do you want a slug on your hand? No. On your face? No. Okay, okay. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was very interesting to see your home lab. Oh. But I have a question about um, the third slug. When the two other slugs are mating, what mm -hmm. does the third one do? No, they're actually, uh, you mean no, the no, no. slugs in the box? Yeah, all slugs, they have partners, right? So oh. there is no single slug because okay. the thing is, uh, we think they might be new species. And to be sure, we have to record their mating behavior. So okay, I have another question about yeah. mating behavior. Do yeah. they ping ping like, hey, Eva, we are mating. Come and watch us. Like, how do you know they are mating right now Oh, yeah, right you're going box? to see that because it can be spectacular depending on which species of snails, for example, but some snails, they actually have their penis on their neck. 
<laughs> and they're hermaphrodites, so they can be male and female, but they kind of all prefer to be a male, because as we know, in life, it's better to be male, right? And Even if you male. are a snail. So they have these penises on their necks, and they're kind of doing some sword fighting. Uh, and everyone wants to, you know, to fertilize. <laughs> if, yeah, they, everyone wants to fertilize the other one, uh, but not to get fertilized themselves. Then, you know, we want to film that, you know, and we are kinky, we biologists. <laughs> yeah. So we actually have to transfer them in some uh, bigger cages or something like yeah. that. Th this, we didn't have time. We just, you know, came back from a holiday where we collected them, and, and so we have to But organize. they are new species, right? Yeah, probably they're new species. Do you have yeah. already a name in mind for those? I cannot reveal no, that okay. uh, before the paper is out. So. We wait then. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. What about uh, you, Aurora? Let's see, where did you take us? Yeah. Hello. Hello, Aurora. How Welcome. are you? I'm good. How are you? It's a very gloomy weather today after so much sunshine. So. Yeah, it's uh, actually nice that it's a little bit fresher than the past few days. Working from home wasn't really nice with all that uh, yeah, hot and sticky weather. So you did not go outside to have a tan or sunbathing? I went to, uh, to swim in the lake, Fleetland, I think it's called and uh well we we enjoyed it it was a uh, nice but uh, it wasn't very clean to be honest <laughs> so it was a nice uh, refresher but uh i i want a, a bit cleaner yeah see the swimming okay yeah. let's go let me close the door oh yes who's this this is Pichu. um that's an italian name oh no. He's a I like this cat. It has decided to leave us alone. Yeah, he's a half uh, Italian, half Dutch. Well, he was born, I think, uh, he was born here in uh, in Leiden. This is a book you are reading currently. Uh, yes, this is uh, called What If. So I, I like science. Uh, I also like weird questions. So this book is basically um, taking weird questions that people ask and uh, answer it with the scientific basis. So for example, what would happen if um, yeah, suddenly a black hole appeared uh, next to the moon or something like that, and then uh, answer in a scientifically sound way. So you are a physicist or you are a chemist or a biologist. 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 Yeah. How do you came into this field? I'm from Rome. I studied uh, biology, both my bachelor and my master in Rome. And uh, well, while studying it, uh, there was one course about viruses and I found it yeah, very fascinating. And then I did an internship uh, about uh, vaccines and viruses here in the Netherlands, uh, in Groningen specifically. And then after that, I did uh, my PhD there. So I just uh, defended it a month ago. So now I'm a doctor in uh, virology. And then after that, I started working in uh, Janssen. So. It was, uh, of course, you don't want to have a pandemic, but uh, it was a good time to be a virologist when I started looking for a job. So you came out of the university direct onto the, onto the frying pan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What do you like to do in your free time? Um, I like, uh, well, uh, I like diving. So that is uh, one thing that uh, I learned to do here in the Netherlands, actually. But I haven't done it in the last year because, well, I don't have my own, uh, um, yeah, first stage uh, breather. So I used to share it with my uh, diving association, but of course you don't want to do that in Corona time. Uh, I also like to, well, build uh, small houses. <laughs> so this is, uh, well, it's, it's more like a relaxed uh, hobby. So when you are stressed or doing something, then you can really focus on very tiny details. And I like that. Your boyfriend is from here or job? Uh, the job. My boyfriend is from uh, Drenthe, but he used to live in uh, Friesland and I used to live in uh, Groningen. And then, uh, yeah, because I got a job here in uh, Leiden. Where did you meet, both of you? On <laughs> Tinder. <laughs> very modern. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, and uh, yeah, you follow me here, you also can work from home. I think I need to let the cat outside. <laughs> Enjoy. Italian food is mostly like, it's very cliche to talk about pizza, pasta, blah, blah, blah. But olive oil, and I was just looking at these bottles. So what is this? 
Yeah, this is uh, my uh, homemade uh, olive oil. My parents have a few, well, 60 olive trees in Italy. Wow. And uh, every year they make uh, uh, well, our own uh, olive oil. And then uh, we get the shipment all the way to the Netherlands. So it's mu it's much nicer than the one you get outside. Yeah, especially the so the fresher one. So this is from last year, and mm -hmm. it says uh, verde, so it's a uh, green. So it's a very um, it's almost uh, pitted, almost spicy. So it has a lot of taste, and uh, yeah, it's especially nice to use it uh, raw. So for example, in uh, salads and so on. And uh, yeah, it's also a very nice gift to give to people, like a homemade uh, Italian olive oil. Um, Tahir was really happy that your cat was antisocial. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually quite social, but uh, yeah, when he has the chance to go outside, he takes it. Yeah, definitely. Um, you made a beautiful house. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit, how did you start making that one? Yeah, I was, uh, well, I was in my PhD and uh, sometimes it's glamorous, sometimes it's... Uh, yeah, a grind, so you have to do a lot of work every day. And uh, so I wanted to do, do something, yeah, that would take my mind off. And this is something that uh, that helps. It was wonderful. Uh, very meticulously yeah. made yeah. in detail. And I have another question. Why do people feel awkward when they uh, speak about Tinder? Uh, I don't know. You, you yeah. smiled. You were like, yeah, yeah, on yeah. Tinder. <laughs> yeah, because I guess it's... Uh, well, it, it would be nice if we were still in a time where people just met by normal yeah. circumstances. I don't know. I guess it's, it also depends on the country. So I think in Italy it's more of a taboo and here a bit less. So here, I'm, yeah, maybe I'm smiling it while I'm saying it, but I am saying it. In Italy, it would be a bit different, so you would say, yeah, yeah we met. In the, park, <laughs> in the park, in the library. Yeah, it's a bit hard because we well, we were living 60 kilometers apart, so <laughs> it would be a big chance to meet, yeah, not by Tinder or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. But, but that's strange. You say in Italy, Tinder is taboo? It's not taboo, but it's ta it's kind of taboo to say that you started a relationship. That oh, way. really? Oh, I It's a bit more that. traditional. Because Italians are the most flirty people in the world. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. But then when you reach the serious <laughs> step, it has to have begun seriously. Oh, ah, okay, okay. Yeah. And somehow Tinder is not serious. Okay, yeah. I uh, I remember in USA, my friends, um, those who actually met on Tinder, they had to have a makeup story. What are we going to tell if people ask us, where did yeah. you meet? And then they would make up a little cute romantic story that would explain how did these people met. Um, mm -hmm. Even in USA, it's still a little bit of a taboo. Not in the Netherlands. People. My boyfriend told this grandma, so I was like, okay. <laughs> that's, that's nice. I also yeah. met my partner over Tinder, so yeah. thank you, Tinder. What yeah, can yeah. I say? Wow, we're advertising Tinder so well. <laughs> yeah. So, right? <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, yeah. um, if it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you in, in another country, and this is how you start. Yeah. Um, yeah. Eva, taxon exhibitions. Can you tell us expeditions? Expeditions, sorry. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. So that is a company I started together with my partner, and we are we are both biologists. And what we do is we organize expeditions to, you know, remote places like Borneo, Panama, Montenegro, places that still have some wild nature. It is. Uh, yeah. With uh, that, so there's a real there are real scientific expeditions where we go to discover new species mm. for science. But what is cool about it that people who are not scientists themselves, but you know, members of the general public, they can also join and participate and learn from us how we do scientific research and just have a real uh, hands-on research experience. So we teach them all the steps, you know, from how do we collect these insects, how do we study them, we write together scientific publications and then we publish papers together with them. We get people from all ages. So the youngest participant was 14 years old. He came with his dad. And our oldest participant was, yeah, 70 something. Um, Aurora, what made you interested in the viruses? I mean, virus is something like, ooh, like that's kind of the first feeling you get. Like, what made you to shift from biology to viruses? Uh, well, I had uh, a course of virology during my, uh, my bachelor, actually. And I found it really interesting because, well, first of all, they can be very deadly, so that's a little bit interesting. Uh, secondly, you, at least I didn't get that feeling of, ooh, I get it more from bacteria, also because when you work with bacteria, it stinks a lot and viruses don't stink. 
so that helps and uh, also because viruses well you can kind of use them to your yeah for your help so for mm. example the Janssen vaccine is a virus that you kind of engineerize to help yourself get vaccinated and also because they are kind of at the interface between uh, life and non-life so they are alive when you and they are in your body and using you to well to get their way but they're not alive in the wild so they are kind of an organic structure that by itself does nothing so it kind of poses the question of what is life what is alive and what is not was there anything um in your covid research that made you think like oh i didn't know this about viruses before um i think yeah, I think something that a lot of people don't realize is uh, the exponential growth. Mm. Even virologists have a hard time with that. In general, humans have a hard time imagining it, what's exponential growth. So most of the people have a kind of normalcy bias and see something bad happening and they are, yeah, their brain kind of pushes them to think it's going to be okay. And that's how you, we humans deal with the unknown. But exponential growth is something that we are not used to. So it's hard to see something that goes from two to four to eight. So the growth, how it goes, it's uh, yeah, it's something that it's new to me in real life. And I think for a lot of uh, virologists to see how quickly things can go wrong, basically. Staying positive. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the procedure when you find a new species, Eva? Like, how do you... How do you go on, like naming it and publicizing it? Yeah, so first when you, we say, collect material, mm. which means you put some kind of traps, for example, in nature, and you collect all kinds of stuff. So there are all kinds of insects there. So you first have to, you know, go through that sample to, to separate different groups, and then you select sort of the group of insects you are working on. So you cannot, uh, I don't know all the insects, you know, I'm specialized, for example, in cave beetles and I can discover new species of cave beetles. But my other colleague works on some other group and he can, dis you know, distinguish new species of that group. So you have to have always uh, on the expedition an expert who can recognize new species. So once you suspecting, oh, this little guy looks a bit different, so maybe it's a new species, we usually have to dissect their genitalia because, uh, yes, uh, the insect uh, penis basically can tell us if it's a new species or not because if the penis is different uh, then it's uh, yeah it's a new species <laughs> that is so interesting so you have a catalog of all the penises definitely that oh, you need yeah. to go through to uh, see yes. if that's similar or not like my my laptop is full of photos of insect penises <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so you have to describe the beetle morphologically, how the specimen look like, but also their gen genitals. And when you when you do that, you can also extract their DNA to see how different is the DNA from all the known species. And then you write scientific publication to to publish your uh, findings. Can mm -hmm. I ask something? Sure. Is, of course. is it uh, well? A lot, of, a lot is known in uh, science about some things, but I, I feel like with insects. There are tons of species we haven't discovered it. So how often does it happen that you think it's not new and it is, or the other way around? So, so yeah, uh, there are still about 80% uh, of animals uh, that are unknown on Earth. And most of those animals are actually yeah. insects, especially teeny tiny, tiny insects that no one ever cared to look. Especially you know. in places yeah. far away. Especially if you go to Borneo, to Panama, to, you know, uh, biodiversity hotspots, yeah. to, to, to tropical, to tropics. So when you go there, it's, it's actually very easy to find a new species. You basically collect some leaves from the ground in the forest, mm -hmm. and it is quite likely that you already got a new species there. Wow. But the trick is, you know, to, to be able Prove to recognize yeah. which one is new and why. And that's, that's why you need experts to do that. Fascinating. But uh, I also want to say, so what, what is cool about when you discover a new species is that you can decide on a name. Did you ever name um, any new beetles after your boyfriend? I did. <laughs> oh, I actually did. Oh my God, I can't believe you're asking me this. Yeah, I did name a new species after my ex-boyfriend uh, because he helped me a lot during my uh, field work. So we were, he's also a cave explorer, so he helped me, you know, to, to, you know, research all these caves and collect these beetles. So I thought he deserves this honor. After you broke up with him, did you have to rename the beetle? No, 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 no. <laughs> you cannot do that. You cannot rename the beetle. Once it's published, 
You can change your opinion about your boyfriend, but the beetle stays named after uh, him. <laughs> yeah. I feel for that beetle. Uh, <laughs> Aurora, um, WHO. Um, I mean, activist community thinks that the knowledge about um, virus as deadly as um, COVID should be basically uh, transparently shared with the public at every stage, at all stages. But then WHO thinks that they should be a spokesperson to share the knowledge as it is necessary. Mm -hmm. What is your take on that as, a, as an expert? behind the research. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a hard uh, line to decide because of course you need to be as transparent as possible, but um, experts also in virology, they have different opinions all the time, not just in viruses or vaccines, but in everything. That's not how science works. Mm. Everyone has a different opinion. So sometimes it's confusing, I feel, for the public mm. when every expert with a slightly different opinion gets a microphone and says something different because then the feeling from the public is oh all experts have a different opinion but that's how it normally goes so i think it's uh, it's good that the discussion is public but it's also good to make clear who has the final say and yeah what the final um, conclusion is mm. because it's normal that there is a discussion ongoing that should be transparent but also the public should know that discussion is normal. It's normal not to have all the answer immediately, especially in a pandemic. It's, it's just not realistic to have all the answers and all of them be correct. Absolutely. Um, that is basically almost the end of our show. Um, but one more thing, we also asked you to bring us the photos of your favorite lighteners, if you have any favorite lighteners within five to seven years, right? As mm -hmm. you have been here. Why don't we start from you, Eva? So, Who is your favorite lightener? So my favorite lightener is my friend, let's call her uh, Mysterious Mrs. M. Mm -hmm. uh, because she doesn't want her face to, to be shown. Uh, and that is because she, she builds some cool projects and they want, as artists, to stay anonymous. Mm. So Mysterious Mrs. M and her boyfriend, who is an expert also from Mexico, living in Leiden, they made a gnome house in Planson Park. Oh, wow. So when this pandemic started, they, they just well, you know, wanted to play around a bit and they made, uh, so, so they made a little uh, kind of gnome house in the tree and, you know, the gnome is, you know, doing stuff. He's, you know, making a garden, he's having Easter eggs. And the interesting thing about it is that the wrong house actually gained the status of monument in Leiden. Oh, that's beautiful. So, yeah, but still beautiful. artists have to stay anonymous. So we understand. That's why the But is it a Leidener yes. or it's an expert? She's a Leidener. Oh, okay. She's that's a Leidener. Good to know. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what about you, Aurora? Who's yeah. your favorite Leidener? Uh, I don't know a lot of people in uh, Leiden yet because, well, I moved during the lockdown. So there was not uh, much of social interaction going on. I read the story about uh, Margaret uh, Neuenstein, mm -hmm. uh, Neuenhaus, sorry. Uh, she's, uh, well, she was also an expert in uh, Leiden, basically. She from was where? She was from the Baltics, mm. from Lithuania, but uh, half German, half Lithuanian. She was an entomologist, so mm. she went to Borneo. Uh, she studied in Zurich uh, together with Einstein, and then uh, she met her future husband in uh, Borneo, and then they moved to Leiden, and they studied uh, botanics and uh, entomology there. And also during uh, World War I, she helped a lot of kids, so she brought uh, to the Netherlands a lot of German kids uh, to kind of recover. And, it's a beautiful um, story. Yeah, it's a very interesting story, and she was... Uh, living in uh, Het Kasteltje, so it's a house uh, in Leiden. It's a very cute, uh, yeah, sort of like a little castle house that she designed herself. So I, I found it a very interesting story, sort of a feminist and scientist mm -hmm. over Definitely. time. Thank you for sharing with us. Well, that's the end of another show. Thank you for being fantastic, funny guests <laughs> in our show. Well, um, end of another episode at Hello Leiden. Um, next Saturday, we are going to be with you again. But in the meantime, please watch us, like us, share us. We are almost everywhere in all the social media accounts. And if you are a foreigner living in Leiden and you have a similar story to share, please let us know at hello Leiden at slotelstand.nl. Have a good evening.
Take care. Hello, Leiden. 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 Hello,